Live from Lincoln Center is made possible by a major grant from MetLife, the company that helps you make sense of it all, and on behalf of MetLife's affiliate, New England Financial. This program is also made possible by grants from Thomas H. Lee and Ann Tenenbaum, the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust, dedicated to enriching the lives of all Americans through medical research, education, and the arts. The Irene Diamond Fund, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick P. Rose, the Fan Fox and Leslie R. Samuels Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Stand by, everybody. Ten seconds to air. Ten seconds. Live from Lincoln Center, another in the series of live broadcasts from the stages of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. This is Martin Bookspan. Tonight, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center presents An Evening of Beethoven. David Schifrin, the artistic director of the Chamber Music Society, will perform in a clarinet trio, and pianist Andre Watts and violinist Leela Josefowitz will play the famed Kreutzer Sonata. Also participating this evening in a string quintet are violinist Ani Kavafian, violists Paul Neubauer and Cynthia Phelps, and cellist Gary Hoffman. This performance is being broadcast live from Alice Tully Hall. Now backstage, here is our host, Beverly Sills. Good evening and welcome to the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, the group that believes audiences want to watch them have the time of their lives playing with their friends. And of course, they're absolutely right. The Society's concerts have a little of the feel of a living room get together. It just happens that the room has a large stage and marvelous musicians are getting together to play on it. This evening, the members of this repertory company of musicians invite friends to join them for an all Beethoven program. All the pieces come from a short five-year span during which an astonishingly accomplished musical genius became something even larger and more intimidating to the composers who would follow. The artistic director may not tower over the landscape like a colossus, but David Schifrin shows that it's good to be in charge of the program when he invites his friends, Andre Watts, and Gary Hoffman to join him for the trio that begins the program. After that, Andre Watts is then joined by the very young but already very much admired violinist Leela Josefowitz for the Kreutzer Sonata. In the second half, the string quintet takes us to the beginning of Beethoven's great unfolding. I'll see you and chat with all our performers at intermission. In the late 1790s, a chamber work that incorporated the clarinet in its texture was still sufficiently exotic to excite keen audience interest. Was this the reason that Beethoven composed a trio for the odd combination of piano, clarinet, and cello? In any case, it is that trio that begins our performance this afternoon. David Schifrin, clarinetist, Gary Hoffman, cellist, and Andre Watts, pianist. The trio in B-flat, opus 11, for clarinet, cello, and piano by Beethoven.
live from Lincoln Center. This has been Beethoven's Trio for clarinet, cello, and piano in B-flat major, Opus 11. Our performers were clarinetist David Schifrin, cellist Gary Hoffman, and pianist Andre Watts. The last of the movements of that trio is a set of variations on a theme that Beethoven borrowed from an aria in an opera by his contemporary, Josef Weigel. And here are our three performers once again. On the left, David Schifrin. In the middle, Andre Watts. And now with their backs to us, now their fronts to us, cellist Gary Hoffman. Now the opening words of the aria that Beethoven borrowed from the Weigel opera are, Before I begin important work, I want something to eat. I wonder if it was that text that turned Beethoven on. We'll next have the A major sonata for violin and piano, the so-called Kreutzer Sonata, which derives its nickname from the circumstances of its composition. Around 1803, Beethoven was toying with the idea of abandoning Vienna and relocating in Paris. Now, we can only speculate what might have been the musical consequences of such a move. Be that as it may, Beethoven set about composing a real technical tour de force of a sonata for violin and piano for the reigning violin virtuoso in Paris, Rodolphe Kreutzer. The title page of the published work says it all. Here is a sonata, quote, in a style molto concertante, almost like that of a concerto. Even so, Kreutzer never played and probably never even heard or saw the score of this tribute to his skill. Here now, violinist Lila Josefowitz and pianist Andre Watts to perform Beethoven's A major sonata for violin and piano, opus 47, the Kreutzer Sonata.
From Lincoln Center, from the stage of Alice Tully Hall, this has been Beethoven's Sonata in A Major for Violin and Piano, Opus 47, the Kreutzer Sonata. Our performers were violinist Leela Josephowitz and pianist Andre Watts. I first encountered Leela Josephowitz a dozen or so years ago when she was an outstanding pupil of the renowned violin teacher Robert Litzett at the Colburn School in Los Angeles. Since then, she has matured into a brilliant and thoughtful solo and chamber music performer. And now the two of them, Leela Josephowitz and Andre Watts, have gone to the backstage area here at Alice Tully Hall at New York City's Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. And the applause recalls the two of them. I'm sure you noticed the embrace that 
they gave each other at the end of the performance. And now they walk off backstage. This is an all Beethoven program being performed for us by players of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. And in just a few moments, there will be a resetting of the stage for in the second half of the concert, we'll have a string quintet of Beethoven's, the C major string quintet, Opus 29. And now let's join our host, Beverly Sills, who is talking backstage with the two musicians you just heard play, pianist Andre Watts and violinist Lila Josefowitz. You two, bravo to, bravo, bravo, you two, <laughs> you. <laughs> you two you. share the stage today, Thank but uh, with a great big difference, Sandra, you're a regular member of the society, and, and you tonight, Leela, made your debut. So I want you to tell me what special quality this beautiful young woman has, apart oh, from being beautiful and young. Time. <laughs> we don't have enough time. That want her this invitation oh. to play with the happy circle. <laughs> I'm just really happy to join you oh, for your God. first... Uh, Chimney Music Society of Lincoln Center visit. It was great fun, great fun. Yeah, and what is the special quality about her that won her this invitation? <laughs> I would say you don't absolutely have to direct, <laughs> yes, close yes, your ears. Don't listen. You know, obviously great abilities, you know, physical abilities yes. that we sort of take for granted. Yes. Absolutely direct communication, no quarter given. Very important. Just direct, straight, and always, always every last chance taken never playing cautiously or well, let's right. be careful here. Whatever the music demands, Sky's the total. Limit. It's yes. nice, it's very exciting. Yes, <laughs> really. Andre. Well, this was no ordinary debut. I mean, that was the kind of splashy Absolutely. little piece they gave you to no, play, I, um, very exposed. I was thrilled about this concert for so incredibly long and I was thinking about it for so long. And to play with Andre, mm -hmm. who is one of my favorite musicians in the world and person, it was just uh, an incredible experience for me and to play with everyone else as well. I mean, incredible people as well as musicians. Funny personalities, sense of humor. That's right, I'm finished, you have to continue working. Yeah. A little scary? <laughs> Not at all, Good. actually. Good, Andre, what, what makes um, a good musician different from the good musician who can play chamber music? Oh, really interesting question. Um, I'm not so sure. It, do you think really there's a difference? There's well, something lacking. You know, if somebody, um, if somebody can't play chamber music and can't listen to their colleagues, then ultimately there will be something lacking in the solo stuff, But let me right? tell you, for years, I was the girl singer with this band. Right. <laughs> and when they first invited me to sing with them, I was really tickled because I thought, terrific. Half the size of the normal house I sing in. You know, 80 musicians, I don't have to buck them. I mean, I just got a little group. But when I joined them, I suddenly realized it was much more than that. It was my two vocal cords became one of the instruments. And it seemed to me it was an ability to listen to each other. Yes. Um, when you're standing in front of a huge orchestra as a soloist, it's, you're with them, but they really have to be the ones who are listening to you. Certainly have to pay attention to what's going on right. behind. Yeah. <laughs> but the ultimate aim uh, it seems to be different. Do you agree with that? Do you, do you do anything different when you both of you are playing a lot with, with symphonies? Well, with you say what you think. Well, um, of course, listening is essential no matter what kind of music you're playing, and as well as communication with the conductor or the other, uh, other musicians. But uh, when you're playing solo at the same time, you have to kind of establish the fact that you're playing as soloist, so it's kind of an interesting balance. Right? I think that maybe, I mean, just as a pianist, perhaps <laughs> when, you, when you get to big solo things in a piano concerto, there is then um, a, a, an easier sense of, of saying, well, I'm gonna do whatever I feel like right now. Whereas even if it's a solo thing, even in a cadenza, in a trio or in a quintet or something like that, you're still thinking about how will my colleagues enter? How, how can I lead them? Listening yes, and watching. Yes, how can I lead them to enter? How, what did they just do that I can put into this cadence? Well, it's so personal. Yes. To play chamber music is so incredibly yeah. personal. And well, it's I want wonderful. to congratulate you both. Thank you. I, I really Thanks. enjoyed it. it Thank you very much. Very much. Joy. Thank you. Always Thank a joy to see you. you. Thank and you. it's to me. Intermission continues here at this evening of Beethoven Chamber Music Concert at Alice Tully Hall. 
Now let's go backstage to rejoin our host, Beverly Sills, as she speaks with Paul Neubauer, Cynthia Phelps, and Gary Hoffman. If any of you wanted to understand how unusual the society is, you just have to look at these three. I mean, uh, right there in the middle is Cynthia, who is the first viola uh, for the New York Philharmonic. And then we have uh, her predecessor, uh, Paul, who is, I uh, was her predecessor, okay. and, and Gary, who commutes from, from Paris. That's to, right. To, uh, that's really wanting to play with the society very badly. Well, yes, and also being American, it's always great to come back to. Well, what country. kind of club is it that brings three people like you together? Well, it's a, a group that, that always is changing. We always have uh, various soloists, like today we have uh, Andre and, and Leila coming in and Cindy coming in, not members of the so society, so it's really a, a great mix of different ideas and spirits coming together. But, I mean, to travel that far, I understand there's another member who comes all the way in from Vienna. Isn't that a long way to travel just to rehearse? Well, you know, I think all of us, in fact, here at the Chamber Music Society have a very varied musical life. And, you know, this is one thing that we do, and we all travel around to do, you know, a lot of different musical activities, solo and teaching and so forth. And I think that, as you were speaking with earlier with Andre, one, one realizes that chamber music is something that's part of our musical diet. And in that respect, there, there isn't so much difference between chamber music or any other musical activity because it's about the same kinds of things, uh, communicating with, with our colleagues and with the well, audience. Well, Cindy, is that true? Tomorrow you will probably go back across the plaza to across Fisher Hall. Across the plaza. I feel very lucky. I can just go back and forth and just, have a just, very enriching musical experience. Do you wear two hats? I do. Um, you bring similar skills, but uh, with a large group, you have to um, make up. F well, there's what we call lag time. When you're playing with 100 musicians, you're trying to respond to one person with a big group. And so you take a little bit more time responding to cues and giving cues, and your cues are bigger. And then you come to chamber music, and there's just a few, few others, and you have to be so rhythmically sharp that it's, it's a big challenge. I, I always think that it's like a conversation, only the conversation is taking place in music, because you have to constantly respond to one another. It, it can't be um, a filibuster where you just get going, you're, you're on your own. Right. Um, that if you don't listen to what's going on, uh, or uh, Mizell used to say that the Cleveland sound was simply because the entire orchestra were chamber music players. That's that they were constantly thought. watching and listening. Well, I think uh, that's what you want in, in the orchestra also. You want a big chamber music group. And that's what the conductors, I think, are trying to achieve. They always want that chamber music feel with this great symphonic sound. And we want the great chamber music feel with chamber music. Intimate conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the few times I really regret I don't sing anymore. I had the best times on that stage with my my buddy Charlie Wadsworth, the repertoire was just so challenging. Um, they're waving at me, so I'm going to thank you very much for speaking with thank me. You. Thank and you. we'll do this some more a little bit longer. Ask people what they know about Beethoven's life, and most will mention Beethoven's deafness. How can a deaf person write music? Obviously, he had it all in his head. If he were born deaf, had never heard sound, had no concept of sound, one would then wonder what concept of music he might have. He was trained at an early age as a musician when he could hear. The buzzing started somewhere around when he was writing his second symphony. That's almost midway in his career. I think if one loses one's hearing later in life, the situation is entirely different because then sound, music, musical imagery, musical memory has established itself. The buzzing began to drown out all the other actual physical oral sounds. But what went on in his head went on. Hearing music in one's mind is the commonest form of uh, imagination or hallucination 
which, which people have. Musical memory and musical imagery may be tremendously heightened in deaf people. There's some deaf people who say that they hear you speak when they lip read you, but in fact they are translating the visual in, in, into the auditory. Now it may have been that Beethoven had this sort of hallucinatory power to sort of play things in his mind. I think probably all composers have. In the case of Shostakovich, the composer, a head injury and a shrapnel fragment in one part of the brain may have played some part in giving him involuntary tunes. Uh, and it's described that as he tilted his head and this, this fragment of shrapnel moved, he would get a sort of cornucopia of tunes. Neurologically, we are very musical animals. Now, once again, let's return backstage. Our host, Beverly Sills, is talking to the artistic director of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, David Schifrin, and violinist, Ani Kavafian. So many of, of our colleagues keep using the word listening uh, in chamber music. Uh, when you play concertos, you're not listening? <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly are listening, but you know, as chamber musicians, we're listening in a different way than someone who has never played in a group, a small group like this. Uh, when I play so, some big concerto with an orchestra and there's a great clarinet solo or an oboe solo, I play differently than I would have whether I was in the chamber music society or not. It's just a different kind of an ear. Um, and it's like chamber music with the orchestra, especially when you play Mozart concertos. I mean, that is chamber music with orchestra. Um, the only difference is that your individuality has to really shine through. So besides your ear, you have to be up there as a soloist as well. They're going to kill me if I don't let you go because you're in the quintet. Yeah, so I... you're just going to have to go, Annie. I'm very sorry. Oh. We'll have a longer conversation the next time. Thank it's, you, Beverly. It's their, it's their fault, totally. Okay. And now Thank we can you. talk about you. Yes, yeah, as soon as you go. If you, if you would just leave, David and I can really, can really have a good time now. I'm not now. sure I should. <laughs> have a great time. David, I know you're thrilled not only to be the big boss of this, this society, but to be a colleague, I mean, that, that's unique. It, it must be thrilling not only to, to do, put all these programs together, but to then to be a part of the programs. Well, that, that's the biggest thrill. It's so funny to hear that, that term, big boss, because, you know, that's a joke. In, in chamber music, Ani was talking about what it's like to listen and play chamber music, and there is no big boss. And the big difference in chamber music is we each have our own part and we, we come together and talk to one another and work it out. But you program it. Oh, yes. And it's, it's a great joy because there are thousands of works to choose from, and, and it's like being a kid in the candy store choosing those works. Where are you finding a new talent today? Everywhere. Everywhere you go. Leela Josephowitz is from California. You hear wonderful talent from Europe, from, from Asia. Everywhere you go, there's so much talent, and the question is, what are they going to do? And the answer is that everywhere we go, people are still listening to music, so there's hope. <laughs> yes, there is. In this, this terribly day-to-day yeah. -day changing world, the great thing is that there are some constants in our lives, and I'm very happy to say that the Chamber Music Society and you are those constants. We feel very fortunate to be here and be doing this. I feel very fortunate <laughs> to be with you. Thank you very Thank you, much. Beverly. And in the second half of this All Beethoven program, we'll have the C major string quintet, Opus 29, composed in 1801. And there's a Mozart precedent. Mozart composed a heroic work for the same instrumental combination, two violins, two violas, and cello. And we'll hear Beethoven's quintet performed by violinists Leela Josephowitz and Ani Kavafian, violists Paul Neubauer and Cynthia Phelps, and cellist Gary Hoffman. Beethoven's String Quintet in C Major, Opus 29.
Live from Lincoln Center, this has been an evening of Beethoven, a presentation of the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, coming to you from the stage of Alice Tully Hall at New York City's Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. And we've just heard Beethoven's String Quintet, Opus 29, in C major. Our performers were violinists Ani Kavafian and Lilo Josefowitz, violists Paul Neubauer and Cynthia Phelps, and cellist Gary Hoffman. And here the five of them are, returning to the front of the stage to acknowledge the applause of the audience. The five works, or the three works that we heard this evening, all were composed within the space of five years, between 1798 and 1803. The earliest of them was the work that began our program, the Clarinet Trio. Live from Lincoln Center's website includes program notes and information about our series. To find out more, visit pbs.org or America Online, keyword PBS. That clarinet string trio was Beethoven's Opus 11 and it began our program today. But by that time, Beethoven had already composed seven piano sonatas, two sonatas for cello and piano, and a sonata for piano four hands. The Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center is one of the most treasured constituents of the entire Lincoln Center complex. And this evening, we've had a galaxy of performers. Clarinetist David Schifrin, who is the director of the Chamber Music Society, pianist Andre Watts, violinists Ani Kavafian and Leila Josefowitz, 
violists Cynthia Phelps and Paul Neubauer, and cellist Gary Hoffman. This is Martin Booksband. Good evening. Presentation of WNET New York. Live from Lincoln Center is made possible by a major grant from MetLife, the company that helps you make sense of it all, and on behalf of MetLife's affiliate, New England Financial. This program is also made possible by grants from Thomas H. Lee and Ann Tenenbaum, the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust dedicated to enriching the lives of all Americans through medical research, education, and the arts. The Irene Diamond Fund, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick P. Rose, the Fan Fox and Leslie R. Samuels Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts.